Welcome back to Seattle Boat Show TV. This is your co-host Peter Trappin, and we find ourselves in the center of the universe, Fremont, Seattle, Washington, at Fremont Mischief Distillery, and I'm here with Mike Sherlock, co-owner of Fremont Mischief Distillery. Hi, Mike. How are you doing, Peter? Very good, very good. This is part of a larger series we're doing as part of Seattle Boat Show TV, Mike, where we are explaining the world in six glasses. You've got more than a few, few different glasses here to choose from, and I just wanted to peek inside Fremont Mischief Distillery, get inside the, the method of your madness, where, where you got the idea for Fremont Mischief Distillery. Well, it just kind of came about. We basically were retiring and didn't want to retire. Wanted to do something, and so we kind of came up with this. And when was that? In 2008. So we're going on our 12th year now. And we're probably one of the, we're like the third distillery in the state. And we started out with rye, and we're pretty pretty predominant on the rye whiskey, and those are our, our brands. Congratulations! You sound like a, a true pioneer, but this was not your first career. What was your your career in the maritime world like? Well, I used to commercial fish in Alaska and, and here, and then I ended up owning a shipyard. So I had a shipyard here in Seattle for quite a few years. And by doing that, we connected with a lot of locals, but a lot of the deadliest catch guys. And then um, that was kind of part of the little deal when we did the distillery. We used to do a lot of things with the shipyard as far as giving back and doing things. And we figured when we started this, we'll create something to give back to the people. How is running a shipyard like running a distillery? <laughs> totally different. Not. Not anywhere the same. So like when I had the shipyard, we had pretty much around 300 full-time employees. So it's a lot different. We had a lot of jobs going on all the time. And uh, it was pretty, I mean, pretty hands-on. So that just got to be kind of wearing after a while. And moving into doing the distilleries a lot, a lot more funner, I think, a little more exciting. And uh, get a lot of opportunity to work with some pretty cool people. Nice. So. What advice do you have for someone who'd want to open up their own distillery? It takes, it takes a, little, a lot of time and uh, you gotta have some money to, cause you're warehousing, you're buying product, you're not getting uh, stuff out. You know, it doesn't just sell right away. You gotta have time with it. But it takes uh, time, patience and, and some money. Given that the uh, COVID-19 became a pandemic on March, on March 11th, what has your world been like since March 11th? Well, you know, um, the cool thing since all that happened, it helped a lot. And it didn't help a lot. It was kind of a weird time. We weren't sure what we were going to do. Uh, luckily, we were able to get into uh, making hand sanitizer. And doing that, we also worked with like Fremont Brewing, Rubens, and uh, seven wine companies that helped get us their product that they couldn't sell, that they were dumping. And we would turn that into vodka and then the vodka turned into sanitizer. So by doing that, it kind of kept all the employees working. Everybody stayed working. Um, everybody chipped in and did whatever they had to do to keep everything going. And we had just opened up the restaurant here at Fremont Mischief, Mischief on Canal. And uh, we were open for about two weeks, and then this all happened. So we got with everybody, the chef, John, uh, employees, and they all wanted to stay working and do whatever they could. To. So we did the sanitizers. We were doing products. We were rebuilding a little bit. So that kind of kept us going. And then um, once uh, COVID kind of straightened out a little bit, we opened up a little more. We had the rooftop restaurant going and it just like well, i know it's curbside pickup is new um how are you catering to the boating public that comes up and down the ship canal well what we have is like the little electric boats right out here in the canal and they'll call ahead and then when they come up alongside we'll run a bag down there but we have uh lunches to go and that's wednesday through sunday and the same curbside pick up so Mike to get into the nuts and bolts of the perfect cocktail 
what are the elements to the world's most perfect cocktail, do you think? You know, basically we think of good products, you gotta have a good product. And we're very careful how we farm it, where we farm it, where we get it. And our aging, our barreling, um, and then the rest kind of comes from our, our mixologists as far as, you know, we have a craft cocktails and a lot of experimenting, a lot of playing around. And that's kind of the, the biggest thing. A little trial and error. Yeah. yeah. Let them have time to experiment, play with, and uh, to craft up and make new things. So. Well, I noticed that you've got a, a new event coming out called Supop. Excuse me, Supocalypse. Yep. Mouthful. It starts January 27th, my birthday. Thank you for that. Nice. Yeah, it runs for uh, through that Sunday, the 31st. What's going on with Supocalypse? Well, what that's about is uh, our chef, John, he kind of came up with this idea of kind of getting all the local restaurants together and creating a, um, a soup challenge. But what it is is uh, if people go around and get a bowl of soup, cup of soup to go, or or whatever, you get a little tag that marks your book, you get a card, you get four cards, and then you're able to come back here to the distillery and it's worth two tastings for two, two people. And kind of a neat thing and we're kind of thinking we're gonna probably do something maybe every month and a half and get everybody together to work on this. So. Well, my stomach is growling. Thanks so yeah. much, Mike, for joining me today. Well, thank you too, Peter. Nice for coming in. We're gonna take a little break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Chef John from Fremont Mischief Distillery. Welcome back to Seattle Boat Show TV. I'm your co-host, Peter Schrappen, and I'm back here at Fremont Mischief Distillery with the executive chef, John Walkie. Hey, John, welcome to Seattle Boat Show TV. Thank you, appreciate you guys being here. Oh, it's our pleasure, our pleasure. Because you're a real glutton for punishment, you decided to start up here in March when nothing else was going on, I understand. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, we had great timing. Um, I got about three days in, actually working in the kitchen, and then, uh, you know, everything kind of turned. But uh, I was lucky enough to be, uh, kept me on here and uh, did some other things while we we're uh, kind of revamping. You know, it gave us a little bit of time to set things up properly, uh, build some things, and, uh, you know, get some new ideas going uh, for our reopening. You're no stranger to the kitchen. What's the best advice that you you personally received about how to become a better chef? Uh, really, it's just it's it's asking questions. You know, uh, if if you don't have an answer to something, you know, keep looking for it. You, you know, I, I get a lot of questions from people, and you know, I can give you an answer when you ask me like, oh, how do you, how do you make this, or why does this work? Uh, but you know, I can come back. 20 minutes later, go, you know, I just thought of something. This is actually why this works. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Forget what I said. Yeah, this is the real. It's, it's, yeah. it's always just thinking about different ideas and, uh, you know, being in your element and whipping something up. Um, and then going back and going, oh, I should have wrote that down. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, you can, you can kind of format stuff that way and just kind of a, it gives that creative element. You know, you don't get that as much um, necessarily when you're doing uh, baking. Uh, but when you are whipping up a soup, you know, that's, you know, that's the best. Do you ever dream about recipes? Has that ever inspired you? <sighs> Too much, yeah. Ah! <laughs> yeah. You know, sometimes it's just driving to work, you know. Yeah. I've worked places where you have a special every day and just that driving to work can be so just monotonous and, and then all of a sudden you say, oh, you know what I'm really hungry for? Yeah. I want to make that too. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. Huh. So, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to have that kind of freedom and uh, ability to make what you're hungry for. And you've got that freedom <laughs> and liberty here at Fremont Mischief Distillery? I've been lucky enough, yes, absolutely. You know, the owners here really, really encourage um, experimenting, trying new things, thinking outside the box. You know, that's uh, what they've done and how they've become successful. And so when I come to them with a cool idea or, you know, a direction I want to go, that they get excited and that makes me excited about it. And you know, that's why I'm here. What are some of the real key cookbooks or authors that have inspired you to become a uh, more adept chef? You know, I, I really try and uh, seek out a lot of people that are local here. Um, you know, there's so many chefs, especially when it comes to, you know, local foraging or seafood. You know, I, I love finding kind of the more obscure 
local local chefs um, to see what they're doing and see how their brain works. Um, you know, and you supplement that with some of the classic French or even some of the older uh, books that I've never heard of any of these people, but these are these are recipes that looks like my grandma and great grandma would make. You know, kind of combining that style of comfort and old school flair to you know what people are looking for on menus nowadays. Um, a lot of fermentation books, uh, foraging books, you know, things like that. What are some of your favorite rules of thumb when it comes to like, using fat or salt or heat uh, in your cooking? You know, it, it just, it varies a lot. Um, and it, it really depends on kind of the, if you're pairing it with anything and really de depend on uh, what your protein is, you know? I mean, salt obviously is a key component. It should be pretty much in everything, but you should never taste salt. You don't want it to be salty. You want the salt to bring out every other flavor in that product um, and you know you can think the same way with fat as well you that it'll, it allows flavors to last because it'll give you more of a coating the flavors will stick around a little bit um, you know there's just so many different varieties you know there's, there's different fats that you can replace with each other when making um, you know if you're using cream if you're using butter if you're using oil uh, if you're using uh, tallow it just kind of depends on a what you can do but a lot of things are interchangeable and once you start playing with the things being interchangeable that's where a lot of creative uh, dishes can come from what are some secret spices that save the day for you time and time again here we've been uh, playing around I, I like to do a lot of finishing um, seasoning so finishing salts or different spices that kind of have that give it that extra flair so either you're getting it on the back end or you're getting that upfront flavor and again finishing salt is important because you you know things that aren't cooked heavy in salt you need that little extra you know we do a lot of smoking with meats and a lot of times you know they're not going to be absorbing a lot of salt because you're not going to be seasoning it as hard as you would want so that finishing salt so you know when you're doing we do a lime finishing salt here uh, we have mushroom salts uh, black lava salts it's the subtleties that really kind of make a dish pop you know it doesn't just look pretty on the plate which but they, but they do <laughs> uh, but it, you know it, it really um does something to the dish you know i'm not putting anything on a plate that isn't doesn't serve a purpose mm -hmm. and you're tasting the food mm -hmm. all along the way that's another definitely thing. have yeah. to do that yeah exactly well we're at a distillery can you share some favorite best practice you have around food and spirit pairing maybe around the rye whiskey for example that you're famous for absolutely you know it's uh, we're i'm very lucky to be able to be right across from the distillery here you know so <laughs> that's convenient yeah, I, I, I get it to sample everything, uh, which is very important. And if you're going to be using it for cooking, uh, you know, these these are really nice, high-end handcrafted spirits. So, you know, just cooking it down sometimes feels like a waste because uh, you want it to kind of come through and speak, you know. So what, what I'll do a lot of times is, uh, like for instance, in our barbecue sauce, we have a, um, our house barbecue sauce is uh, finished with whiskey. What I'll do is we'll cook it into it a little bit, and then at the very end, I'll actually have a little more so you can get that flavor in there uh, towards the end of the cooking. So you're not cooking out any of the flavor or it isn't disappearing in there. You want that to kind of still have some sort of prominence in there. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they, there's a lot of things to pair. You know, people are definitely afraid of pairing with liquors um, because they're very harsh and, you know, it's very understandable. Cocktails are a little bit easier, wines are a little bit easier. But with this selection, this isn't your typical rye that's normally spicy. You know, it doesn't have that harsh spice that you typically think of with rye. You know, these are very mellow. Um, they use kind of that more of that wet wheat. You know, it's right out in Skagit here, so this is the locally sourced. Very, very easy drinking whiskey. Yeah, nice. and that helps a lot with uh, when it comes to pairing. Mm. Good advice. Good advice. Yeah. What does your menu look like today? Um, so today, you know, it's it's winter. Um, that usually means for chefs, there's not as much seafood on the menu. Char! <laughs> yeah, you're all, we're going in one direction. Yeah. That's about all we got. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we definitely still try and get, uh, again, uh, make sure we're doing local sourcing properly. So there are some, um, you know, uh, flash frozen uh, salmon that was, uh, so, you know, brought over. So we're still doing some smoking uh, or salmon. We have a salmon grilled cheese. Guys, why not oh, be decadent about okay. it? Yeah, what kind of cheese? 
Uh, we're using a uh, local goat cheese that we mix with herbs and uh, spices, and so also features white cheddar. You wouldn't want a cheese that would overpower a salmon, I would guess. That, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, smoking it in house like that, it's a sockeye, so it's going to have a great flavor, great smoke to it. And both of those cheeses do have, you know, some strength to it, but it won't overpower it. You know, we, we, this is one that, um, for example, we were talking earlier how. You gotta kind of test around and play with things. You know, we tried it with um, Dungeons Crabs, and one loves crab. But you know, it, it, it's such a delicate thing. There's so many fish out there that are so delicate that it just kind of loses in there. So we don't want that to happen. And, you know, having a good piece of sake like that, yeah, it's the way to go. <laughs> well, what's next for Chef John Walkie? What, what are you looking for in the spring then? Um, you, you know, spring is when every chef gets excited again. Okay, <laughs> you know, comes you out of the hibernation a little absolutely. bit. Absolutely, yeah. you know, it's just, I'm big in um, foraging and looking for fun things to play with, and that's when everything starts sprouting up. Um, you know, when I first came on was about that time, and that's when I, you know, I came in here with a big bushel of uh, spruce tips. So we were making some vespers. I, we were doing a spruce tip and uh, nettle butter. Uh, you know, things like that, and that's it's just fun to play around with, experience things. <laughs> I get excited when a table orders something like that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've never heard of that. Wow, cool. You can eat that? Yeah, right. Yeah, it's actually really delicious. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that's what really uh, keeps it going for me. As we wind down here, what advice would you have someone who maybe is not as comfortable ordering a stiffer drink? Maybe they're kind of stuck in their beer and wine ways. Well, what advice would you give? You know, it, it's really... You got to put yourself out of your comfort zone sometimes, you know, especially here. I've talked to a lot of people that have always been kind of that, that direction. They don't like the bitterness. They don't like, you know, a, a straight liquor. Um, but you go to places crafting it correctly and, you know, we have great options. Uh, we, we have a flight of Manhattans. They're each made a little bit differently. And that's a great way to really test where your palate's at. Some people like it, you know, drink more on the bitter side. Some like it more on the sweet side. Some want to taste that liquor that you have in there. Some don't, and um, you know it's there's no wrong answer. But um, you know, having a good product, going to places that has great mixologists like we have here, and it's it's the way to do it. And you, I, I would suggest going kind of across the menu with it and keeping some notes maybe and yeah, yeah absolutely see, see how it strikes you and how the buzz is and yeah. yeah. I'm Peter Schrapp, and that's Chef John Walkie. Chef John, where can people find you? Up uh, here. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mischief on Canal. Uh, you can also check us out online. Uh, you can Google Mischief on Canal. We have a website uh, or go to uh, FremontMischief.com.